Hi, this is Celia Lito, the coral reproduction biologist here at Moat. Celia, can you tell us about your background and your focus here at Moat? Sure. Um, so my background mm -hmm. is in general marine science and biology. So okay. I went to school and I received a dual BS in marine science mm -hmm. and biology. And throughout my time there, I worked in a couple research labs. So I my first research project was in um, nutrient density and the influence of symbiont shuffling and coral and then I moved on to coral disease and then I did my thesis on the impact of sunscreen and um, chemical pollution on corals oh. um, and then I moved on to becoming an aquarist so I mm -hmm. worked in the hobbyist industry for a while and I did a lot of water chemistry and um, the building of life support systems and also making tanks pretty, essentially. <laughs> um, and then I came here to work in reproduction at Moat. Cool. Uh, and my current work is in optimizing and studying every aspect of coral reproduction. So we study everything from predicting coral reproduction, understanding how different species function, and how to take care of them as they go through the various stages of their life cycle. So what do you love most about what you do here at Moat? Mm, there are a lot of things that mm -hmm. I love, fortunately, but I probably say that my favorite thing is how I get to do work both in a laboratory and in the field. So I do about a 50-50 uh, balance between working in the lab and working with microscopes mm -hmm. or um, working in tanks, you know, feeding general coral husbandry. Yeah. Uh, and then I do a lot of scuba diving as well, which is really, really fulfilling because mm -hmm. at previous positions, um, I either worked in one or the other. So I wouldn't see the whole process. Mm -hmm. With this job, I'm really lucky to see the entire process mm -hmm. starting in the lab, going out into the ocean, and then seeing those out plants succeed, which is really, really exciting and really fulfilling. So that's cool. definitely my favorite part. It's <laughs> amazing. Mm. So what made you want to start learning about coral? Mm. I had a lot of things mm -hmm. that made me want to learn about them. It would be hard to pick just one. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the biggest influence was I went to Tampa, Florida mm -hmm. when I was young to visit some family. And there was a patch reef off of the, the coast of Tampa. And I remember snorkeling there as a kid. And then when I turned about eight or nine, mm -hmm. uh, it just wasn't there anymore. And I didn't understand why that was at the time. And then I later got my scuba certification. Mm -hmm. And I did a capstone project in high school with the Coral Restoration Foundation. And that was the first team to actually explain mm -hmm. what I was observing, which is just overall ecosystem degradation. Mm -hmm. um, and they were some of the first people I saw could actually, A, do something about mm -hmm. this crisis, and then B, you could have a career at it. Mm -hmm. So I just pursued that wholeheartedly, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so I know that Florida's um, coral is stressed. Mm -hmm. So how much of the coral, how mm -hmm. much of Florida lost its coral? Mm -hmm. So it, depending on which area you're looking at. It can mm -hmm. be anywhere from 50 to 95 percent. So mm -hmm. in general, we like to say over half of the coral reefs, but it is dependent on which areas you're looking at and which species you're referring to. Okay. But I, I would say just slightly over half. Okay. Um, can you explain how often coral mm -hmm. reproduce? Yeah, so um, it depends on the species again, but the species that I work with typically reproduce only once a year. Typically, the most species will reproduce in mm -hmm. August every year, but they can sometimes go in July and sometimes in September. Okay. Um, and it takes a lot of energy and a lot of times for coral to prepare for okay. spawning season, which is why it only happens on an annual basis mm -hmm. and not multiple times a year. So what are the main stressors that prevent mm -hmm. corals from reproducing? There's a lot, mm -hmm. um, and they all <laughs> combine <laughs> together to make this perfect storm of mm -hmm. stressors. Yeah. But uh, the main thing that we're observing in the Florida Reef Tract right now is a combination of disease and thermal mm -hmm. stress. Okay. Um, any form of disruption in their daily life or mm -hmm. daily state uh, can upset their ability to okay. produce gametes, uh, therefore they cannot reproduce. And because disease is a huge issue mm -hmm. in the Caribbean reef track right now, uh, we're noticing that a lot of corals aren't spawning because they mm -hmm. become sick or start showing signs of becoming susceptible to those stressors. Okay. So that will prevent them from spawning. So mm -hmm. does the inability of corals to reproduce cause them to die? So it wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. kill the individual colony itself. Some corals just mm -hmm. aren't fit to be parents, mm -hmm. and it's just like humans or any other animal. Some mm -hmm. just don't have the ability to reproduce. And although that's not ideal, that won't kill the colony. Mm -hmm. They'll just simply exist, and they'll just never reproduce. Okay. However, the inability to reproduce is detrimental mm -hmm. to the ecosystem as a whole. Okay. In order for a reef to be functional and self-sustaining, it must be able to produce new genetic diversity on a regular basis and be able to adapt to new stressors through sexual reproduction. Okay. So if a colony is not able to reproduce, it's not beneficial to the ecosystem mm -hmm. as a whole, but it won't kill that colony itself. Okay.
Cool. How do you know um, that a coral is disease resistant? So there's a couple ways that we measure that. Mm -hmm. um, the general way that we try to test that is through resilience screening. Okay. So whenever our team uh, produces new genetically unique individuals through assisted sexual reproduction, mm -hmm. As they age, we will fragment them um, into multiple replicates, so we'll make clones of them um, through fragmentation, and then we will run them through varying experiments where we will expose them to either stressors or disease, um, or really you can test anything with these, but in reference to disease, we'll expose them to different ones okay. that we are aware um, of that are a big issue on the reef. We can see whether or not they become infected, if their microbiome changes, if they bleach, if they experience tissue recession, mm -hmm. all that jazz. And with that data and with multiple years of replication with that, we are able to determine if they are more or less resilient to certain stressors, whether it's white band disease, um, stony coral tissue loss disease, mm -hmm. um, really anything that we're able to study, we try to screen for resilience for that. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So how do you know in a nursery that a coral has a high probability of spawning? Mm. So every summer, my mm -hmm. PI, Dr. Hannah Cook, she's the head of the reproduction department, uh, and I, we go out to the spawning nursery and we do something called sexual maturity assessments, okay. or SMAs. How we do that, um, once again, it's species dependent, but in our branching species, mm -hmm. we'll do something called cracking. Um, where you take a little snip on the inside of one of the branches and you can mm -hmm. actually see uh, in July or August, September, depending on when that predicted spawning window mm -hmm. is for that species, you can actually see if they're producing gamete bundles. Um, okay. They look like little pink dots on the inside mm -hmm. of the skeleton and that's how we're able to determine if they're ready to spawn and how far out we are from uh, witnessing spawning. And then in our massive species, which are the big bouldering corals, like brain corals, um, Montastria cavernosa, mm -hmm. all these just enormous corals. Okay. They don't have branches, but they cover a lot of surface area. So we will actually take a drill and we will core a small tissue sample and we will look inside their skeleton and look for the same thing, whether or not we can see the presence of gametes. Okay. So that's how we're able to predict everything. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So how did you learn that your restored corals mm -hmm. um, reproduced? So we are really lucky to have access to mm -hmm. a lot of um, people who want to help our work. Mm -hmm. So we send out dive teams to either go out and film uh, certain colonies that we predict would be able to spawn mm -hmm. within a potential window. So we will have dive teams go out in the dead of night because it always happens yeah. overnight. And they will have um, non interruptive <laughs> lights that be mm -hmm. able or um, low light sensitive cameras to be able to film spawning. Mm -hmm. um, we also work collaboratively with a lot of other research teams that will um, observe spawning within their laboratory or around their own um, outplants and we will just compile our data. So mm -hmm. we, I remember the, the biggest spawning event that happened at Moat was uh, my PI, Dr. Mm -hmm. Hannah Cook. She has been observing this uh, colony of Orbicella fabulata in 2020. Um, it was outplanted five years prior, so it had survived Hurricane Irma, it had survived mm -hmm. bleaching, it had survived disease, and we were a little worried that it wasn't going to spawn. Mm -hmm. uh, but during its predicted window, she went out and she waited, and there was a whole camera crew there mm -hmm. and everything, and it spawned right in front of her. So that was one of the most exciting things mm -hmm. <laughs> for our team. Um, but we just have a lot, a lot mm -hmm. of people that go out and observe, and we share data and then we mm -hmm. also uh, will bring corals into the lab and observe them with our own eyes as okay. well. So. so how did you feel hearing that news? That must have been a really good day for you. I was you. very excited. Yeah. It's, it's really reassuring to have confirmation mm -hmm. that the work that we're doing um, is going to create functional self-sustaining mm -hmm. reefs in the future because something that we have to consider is, you know, if we are able to settle corals and care mm -hmm. for them from a really young age and then get them to the point where they're adults and we can outplant them, that's great, but will they be able to function on their own once we stop? Mm -hmm babysitting them essentially. Mm -hmm. And that was confirmation that this type of work is going to be beneficial and may be the missing step in our restorative mm -hmm. efforts. That's amazing. Yeah, it's so exciting. So can you grow genetic genetically modified um, mm -hmm. versions of coral to increase the mm -hmm. chances that restored corals will reproduce just like naturally occurring corals? Yeah, so Anything that we do is not necessarily considered genetically modified mm -hmm. because all we're doing is uh, ensuring that colonies that would naturally mm -hmm. interact in the wild are more successful. So we're not genetically modifying anything. Mm -hmm. It's just more controlled breeding per se. Okay. So. Um, 
But there are other efforts that I'm not a part of, that other research labs have um, done with actual genetic modification. Mm -hmm. um, none of those are being outplanted currently because they are not genotypes that would exist in the wild and we're unsure of the impact that they would have okay. on a large scale environment. But in laboratories, they've been able to cross, I think it was like Curacao, uh, Floridian reef tract and mm -hmm. Panamanium coral, they were Acropora palmata, they were able to cross mm -hmm. three and they made a genetically modified um, offspring of that. However, they're still really early in that process and we don't even know if they're able to spawn or anything like that. Um, but those are not meant for outplanting, those mm -hmm. are strictly for research, where our work is just um, taking colonies and putting them in a more controlled environment just to make sure that they are as successful as, po uh, as possible because mm -hmm. another issue that we experience in the wild is because coral are declining so rapidly they are not physically mm -hmm. close enough to each other that when they do spawn that those gametes will interact so by making sure that they're in a laboratory mm -hmm. and can do it by hand it just makes sure that doesn't go to waste cool mm -hmm. so what are some of the most surprising discoveries you've made about coral reproduction mm. It's always tough because I feel like there's so many like <laughs> cool things that we're able to observe every day, which is so lucky and so fun. But um, I'd say that my one of the coolest things is simply the fact that even though a lot of the, the species that we work with, we work with about five species at a time, within those species, the difference in their growth patterns and their color um, and how they react to the environment within their own tanks is drastically different between all the different families and the crosses. Um, for example, when some corals uh, get stressed mm -hmm. uh, from UV light, they will fluoresce green. Yes. Um, and it's really interesting to see how different families, like an entire tank, if they get a little too much sun during like mm -hmm. a hot day, which is completely normal, it's nothing to be worried about, mm -hmm. but they'll, they'll tell you, like, mm -hmm. I'm getting too much sun because they'll start glowing, essentially. Mm -hmm. And some of them will be really, really green and others will still be their normal brown. Mm -hmm. um, or when you put them under blue UV light, because mm -hmm. we use that um, to observe uh, their fluorescence, we can observe, um, when corals are really tiny, we can make them fluoresce on plugs so we can count them for inventory purposes. They are all completely different colors, <laughs> which is insane. It looks like a rainbow. Some are like blue and green and red, and it's just wow. gorgeous. And I, I have never really, until this position, looked at so many different corals <laughs> under UV lighting, and it's just incredible mm -hmm. to see how different they are, and all you have to do is just change the lighting. I think that's really cool. What mm -hmm. do you hope to discover um, mm -hmm. about coral over the next year or so? Mm. I hope to discover a lot of things. <laughs> um, I think one of our biggest research goals right now is to optimize post-settlement care in coral. So when coral reproduce, they um, will their gametes will interact in the water column mm -hmm. and they'll have a quick couple days where they're able to actually swim through the water mm -hmm. before they settle down and they transform into the big colonies that mm -hmm. we are more familiar with. That early metamorphosis that happens is one of the most sensitive life stages um, within coral. And because they are uh, sensitive, there's still a lot of room for improvement to in improve their conditions to make sure that more and more survive every year. And we've done a really, really good job of being able to upscale mm -hmm. how many do well and make it to adulthood. But I want to continue figuring out what water parameters, what lighting, what food, what just general conditions mm -hmm. do they need to be the most successful. And that is one of our research priorities, and that's what I want to really try to discover <laughs> or dissect the most, I guess is the best way to put it. Well, Celia, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed this. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here. Sure. Anytime. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Is this the fluorescent that you were talking about? The yeah, so these guys yeah. are fluorescing. Mm -hmm. um, so some fluoresce to the naked eye mm -hmm. and some just, like for example, uh, MC11 in mm -hmm. the back here. Um, he has brown tissue mm -hmm. around the outside, but the inner mouths are such like a really vibrant, like bright green okay. chartreuse almost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that is just natural fluorescence. Mm -hmm. And under the lights, it's much easier to see it when you have a blue wavelength on them because that uh, energy signature allows mm -hmm. them to reflect uh, the light back in the fluorescent form, which is why it looks so bright to our eyes. And MC58 is really naturally mm -hmm. green and blue and just very vibrant. And then this guy, he's got light blue mouths, mm -hmm. they're all green. And uh, that's what I was saying earlier, I was so excited about yeah. is because like, even though they all come from these like different mm -hmm. colonies, they all end up looking completely mm -hmm. different, which is crazy. Just like how different the appearance is and how they handle everything. So pretty. Um, but this is our ex situ spawning system, mm -hmm. which stands for um, ex situ means outside of its natural environment. Okay. So this is referred to as a spawning system because 
Although it just kind of looks like a big fish tank, there's mm -hmm. a lot more going on. We have a lot of machinery on this that allows us to exactly recreate seasonality and the cues that corals use to synchronize their spawning. Okay. So what we do is we take corals in from the wild. Last year we used Acropora mm -hmm. palmata, which is elkhorn coral, okay. and we place them in this tank and I programmed the temperature, the tidal patterns, and the lighting regime to yeah. reflect the exact solar and lunar cycle and the seasonal cycles um, that they would experience in the wild. And that is how corals know when to spawn. It mm -hmm. is down to the minute that they can synchronize so that they all interact at the same time. And one of the issues that we're experiencing or observing in the wild is because of light pollution mm -hmm. and climate change, those thermal and light cues are interrupted and yeah. that can cause asynchronous spawning, which is why some reefs are no longer able to reproduce on their own. And that's where people like us step in mm -hmm. and use machinery like this to help us. Okay. Um, but then after last year, we started putting in some of these MCAV plates, so that's mm -hmm. Montastria cavernosa or great star coral. Mm -hmm. uh, they're called great star coral because they have these big expressive nails and yeah. they're <laughs> my favorite for that exact reason. Um, but our goal is to encourage these guys to reach dinner plate size, mm -hmm. which is required in order to reproduce because it's heavily density mm -hmm. dependent. They cannot reproduce if they're too tiny because it yeah. takes too much energy. And we take these uh, clones of each other, or fragments, they're all the same genotype. Mm -hmm. We put them on a plate, they fuse together, okay. and instead of having to wait uh, about 30 years for these colonies to become sexually mature, mm -hmm. we can help them reach sexual maturity in about five years, oh, wow. which is a really big difference. Yeah. Um, and we're having them fuse uh, by giving them ideal conditions to mm -hmm. grow, and then we will observe them spawning, and we will continue making new coral from them. So these are gonna be our resident mm -hmm. spawning colonies that are gonna stay in this tank for years. And then eventually we'll be able to put a canopy over this mm -hmm. and I will program this tank to give seasonal cues that are a couple months uh, either forward or backwards. So that way we can focus on wild mm -hmm. colonies and then we can trick these guys kind of into spawning like a couple months later mm -hmm. when we have less on our plate and we're able to observe them hopefully at around 10 a.m. our time and mm -hmm. not like midnight. So. <laughs> That's so cool. So, yeah. yeah. And it makes it look pretty. Mm -hmm. They're always sitting here, I can tell, when they want food and then they're happy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so that's our XC2 spawning system. Um, cool. And then I don't know, do you want to see what babies look like? Yeah. Yeah, so over here, this is Orbicella fabulata and Orbicella uh, annularis. Mm -hmm. um, this is another species of massive coral, so they don't branch. Mm -hmm. um, they grow a lot in the same style as the okay. MCAV there in that tank. Um, but these guys were spawned and settled in August of last year, so 2021. So they aren't even a year old. Oh, and they so are small. so tiny. Let me see, Aww. but every single polyp is an individual. Mm -hmm. um, and they're gonna, it takes them a long time to grow in mm -hmm. the species just because um, that's just how they are. <laughs> they are just a bouldering species, mm -hmm. so they take a little bit longer, and it'll take them about two to three years to cover an entire plug. Wow. And then we have our Acropora cervicornis and palmata, which are our branching species, mm -hmm. and those guys can cover a full plug in less than a year. So, and it, we have some downstairs that I don't know if you'd like to see, yes, but um, <laughs> you can see a really big difference mm -hmm. in the species yes. for sure. But this is an example of how tiny they are. This is a really long process. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> many years, mm -hmm. but it's worth it. <laughs> um, but yeah, these are our babies, mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of babies. And then I can actually show you an example mm -hmm. of one of our larger. So this is a branching species. Mm -hmm. This is Acropora cervicornis. Wow. So this guy, I believe, is about three years old. However, he's been fragmented multiple times. Mm -hmm. So he, if he was in the wild completely untouched and not fragmented, he'd probably be like the size of my chest, which is how big our spawning colonies are. Okay. Um, but this is how different the branching species look versus those massive bouldering mm -hmm. species. So it's a completely different growth style. Um, and this is one of my favorites because he's got this little curly cue <laughs> right there. I think it's so fun. But <laughs> that's how big they can get. And they can mm -hmm. grow really, really large in these tanks but then they grow even faster when we put them out in the wild. So we try to get them out into the wild uh, in their natural habitat as quickly as possible. Yeah. But yeah, it's cool. Um, and I don't know what else you guys want to see around here. <laughs> but, think, honestly. Um, we have a lot going on. I mean, so we mm -hmm. have the, our whole spawning process also written out on the wall here. It's a little oh. presentation because as I mentioned earlier, it can be mm -hmm. kind of hard to visualize without having something yeah. to look at. So this essentially describes the process of going out into the nursery, mm -hmm. conducting those sexual maturity assessments yeah. on our spawning colonies. Mm -hmm. And this picture right here, slide eight, shows 
what those game meat bundles look like. Okay. When they look like this, that means we're a couple weeks out from spawning because their game meats are nice and dark and you can see them with mm -hmm. the naked eye. Um, and when that's ready, we come back to the lab and we prepare uh, for spawning and we will take uh, whatever species we're working with. In this picture, it's Acroporus cornus, And we will put them either in bins or in, in their own tanks, and we will wait for them to spawn overnight. It kind of looks like reverse snow. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, it'll just happen out of nowhere. It's really exciting. Uh, and they all go in synchrony, even mm -hmm. if they're not in the same tank, which is crazy. It's <laughs> all the lighting cues, the thermal cues. Mm -hmm. That's how they're able to time it. And then we collect it by hand. Uh, we will allow the game meat bundles to dissolve into sperm and egg. Mm -hmm. And then we will uh, fertilize them by hand so that way we can control the crosses and make sure that we understand the full pedigree and the family history mm -hmm. essentially. And that is a huge component of our research. Mm -hmm. um, so in this controlled style, we're able to understand the coral's entire life history and its family history, which is really okay. important in genetic management. Um, and then we essentially go through the whole process of settling them. So they mm -hmm. are swimming around in their planular stage, which is the only time that a coral is mobile in mm -hmm. its life. And then we use Crustose Coralline Algae, um, which is also referred to as CCA for short. Mm -hmm. It is a naturally occurring purple encrusting algae that is used as a settlement cue. Mm -hmm. So the corals will literally sniff that out and mm -hmm. they will settle under the plug and then they turn into this little jellyfish shape <laughs> and start to put down their skeleton. And then they will become infected with that zooxanthellae or the mm -hmm. symbiodiniaceae, the symbiotic algae in their tissues. It starts to look like they get little freckles. Mm -hmm. And then they can start photosynthesizing. And then we yeah. grow them out, fragment them, send them through resilience screening or outplant them, donate them, whatever needs to be done so we can continue. And then eventually they will, once they're big enough, return mm -hmm. back into the spawning group and we'll complete the life cycle. <laughs> <laughs> so cool. So how long are they mobile? So it's a really short period of time. Um, once again, it depends on the mm -hmm. species, but typically can only typically be from two to one and a half weeks. Oh, wow. um, they are essentially in the water column developing. So mm -hmm. unlike humans or any other animals that we're a little bit more familiar with, they develop with either an egg or a womb, but they do mm -hmm. this in the water column and they will eventually develop a flagellum so they can mm -hmm. swim around. Um, and once they reach that stage, they are immediately sniffing out that crustose coral and algae and looking for a reef essentially to settle on. Um, so if they're able to sniff out that cue, they'll work their way down in the mm -hmm. water column. And we do this in very controlled, calm mm -hmm. tanks to give them the best chance. But in reality, they're in the wild. They're getting tossed around by the surf. So yeah. they can, mm -hmm. might take them a second to get down to the bottom, um, which is why it's a, a window mm -hmm. of about a couple days to one and a half weeks. But um, we typically observe it for only about three days in the lab. So. Okay. Yeah, not long. Mm -hmm. And then they spend the rest of their life in the same spot <laughs> until we outplant them. Yeah. <laughs> so how long have you been working here? Uh, I have been working here since June 2021, so oh, wow. I'm just approaching one year. Mm -hmm. So Did not very long. Did you do long. any internships here? No, actually. So I um, just saw an opening for oh. this job. We're actually going to go around this corner right here. I saw a job posting and I've always been reading Dr. Cook's papers yeah. in college and I saw that she posted a position mm -hmm. and I worked a little bit in reproduction okay. prior to this job, mostly with observing a spawning on land mm -hmm. with the University of Miami. Yeah. Um, and I just saw that they needed an aquarist who right. has done that before. And I saw it was Dr. Cook and I freaked out because yeah. I love her. And <laughs> <laughs> then I applied and it worked out because nice. they uh, have a background in aquarium husbandry, mm -hmm. which was the biggest thing because my expertise is in post-settlement mm -hmm. care. So taking care of these guys mm -hmm. is the reason I've been in school for so long. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Fast. All right, so let me see if I can turn off the pump so you can see it a little okay. bit better. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to slip in front of you. Let's see, okay. So, I don't know where you'd like me to stand. It's most effective for you. You've got the kiss there. The words are the hardest part. <laughs> there we go, okay. Sorry about that. It's okay. All right. So these corals, this is Acropora cervicornis, these guys, believe it or not, were settled and spawned at the same exact time as the other babies that you saw upstairs, but they look no completely different and are a completely different size. Mm -hmm. And that's because this is a branching species and that was a uh, bouldering species. Okay. So this just shows the differences, not only with the species, but mm -hmm. between the families. So for example, let me find a good <laughs> one. So this 
is Colony 3S by 44E. Essentially what that means is that Colony 3, we use the sperm from that one, mm -hmm. and then the egg from Colony 44. Okay. So that means that 3 is essentially the father, 44 is the mother. Okay. These guys are huge. They're growing, they're, some of them have already covered the majority of their plugs. Yeah. Now, in another family, let's see, like, Hmm, this one, 7, let's say, yeah, 7S by 41E. Okay. You can see that there's a lot of shrimpy guys in Aww. here. And that can just show the difference mm -hmm. that families and the pedigrees that each coral has, how much of an influence it can have. And that's just one aspect mm -hmm. of these guys. Just because someone is bigger or smaller or grows faster than another one, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're more or less fit to be on the reef. That's just a trait that's being carried, okay. and that is one of the things that we're looking at. Just because some of these guys are a little bit smaller, one of them might be resilient to disease, one of them might be more resilient mm -hmm. to bleaching, or um, will be able to reproduce better, be more fertile or fecund, as we say. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different aspects that we're studying, but there's really big differences mm -hmm. that you can see from the very beginning of their life cycle, and this tank is a really good example mm -hmm. of that. Um, and also, I love these guys because their tentacles are really fluffy, and mm. you can always tell when they're super happy. Yeah. And these guys are really fluffy today. It's good hair day. So, so the mm. tech, I was actually going to ask about mm. like the textures. So are they like hard? Because they look very like jello-ish, like so, squishy. So, yeah, um, it depends. Again, on the species, as mm -hmm. everything does. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the actual tissue on top of the skeleton is very squishy. Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty soft, actually, and it kind of feels like hair in a way. Um, but they will retract their tentacles the second that you touch them, and then you will feel the skeleton underneath of them. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, whenever we're handling them or fragmenting, we try to be as gentle as possible. Um, but if you ever catch them when their polyps are out, you can definitely feel that like soft yeah. layer of tissue. Mm -hmm. Um, that's true for most corals. Every coral that we work with is a stony coral, um, but there are species of soft corals, um, especially in the hobbyist trade, mm -hmm. that are not endangered, but they are completely soft. They don't really have mm -hmm. any structural support to them. They're just like a bunch of tentacles, cool. and they're super, super mm -hmm. soft. They feel like anemones, almost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it depends on which part of the coral that you're talking about, yeah. but the outside is soft, and the skeleton is very hard, just like your teeth, essentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. <laughs> I always like to show people the difference between the tanks because yeah. it really shows like how different each species is. This and is gigantic yes. compared to the other one. There's thousands of coral yeah. in here. And every coral on a plug is genetically unique. Mm -hmm. So just because they come from the same family, it's kind of like siblings, but mm -hmm. they're not clones of each other. Yeah. We will end up um, fragmenting them, so essentially mm -hmm. making clones that way. Um, but these guys are all completely unique and because one of the biggest issues that we have on our reef right now is a lack of genetic diversity due to their inability to mm -hmm. reproduce um, or just because of lack of coral in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's really exciting to know that every year we can create thousands and thousands of new individual and mm -hmm. that is essentially the backbone of a functional reef in itself. So cool. this tank is just like a big old clump of hope. So. <laughs> really exciting. Cool. But yeah.